Rajesh Merchandani is my name. I'm the Senior Director of Communication and Policy Outreach at the Center for Global Development, which is a think tank based in Washington and London that focuses entirely on international development issues and seeks to change policy. I've been there six months. Before then, I was a BBC journalist, hence my connection to this panel for 21 years. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and talking to some very, very interesting people. Let me go down the line and introduce them to you. Laura Gamsey is a filmmaker and also works with the organization The Life You Can Save, which is an EA-affiliated organization here at the conference. Uh, Nico Pitney from the Huffington Post, and Dylan Matthews from Vox, I'm sure need no introductions. Uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to go down the line. We're going to ask people, ask our panelists, to talk for a few minutes about their connection or how, what connection do they feel to the area of effective altruism. And then we'll ask some questions. Um, and then you guys will get to ask some questions as well. We'll take questions within the panel. Uh, Laura has prepared a presentation. The other guys have not. Uh, <laughs> and neither have I. <laughs> so Laura, I'm going to ask you to go first. Explain to us why you're here and what your connection is. And okay, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try to go fast through the presentation, everyone, because I realized maybe you don't want to sit through a presentation. Um, is the click just the space bar or arrows? Got it. Why don't we ask Nika to talk for a few minutes about your work and its connection to effective altruism? Sure. Um, I guess in my own work, after graduating college, I ended up at the Center for American Progress, and I was trying to find that was a, an effort to do as much good as I could. It was a, the President Bush was in power. It was the sort of Democratic White House in waiting. And, uh, and I thought, um, and they were doing some um, aggressive, putting, putting energy into internet um, organizing and communications. And that seemed like a good uh, area to make significant impact. And then when Huffington Post came around and, and had some early success, they see it, the idea of building a progressive media outlet that was not foundation funded, but that could be profitable and um, help make a space for other uh, such organizations seem to be a substantial impact. And, I, and now my thinking is on how to um, get journalists and, and the media writ large to adopt EA values. And I guess the two questions I think about are one, how many journalists, um, when they're considering what story to pursue, and how many editors, when they're thinking about assigning stories or what should what stories should get coverage, think about uh, what stories will have the greatest social impact? And I think that the answer is very few. And how many of us here know which media outlets are doing the most sorts of stories that would have large social impact and, and the fewest. And I think we probably don't know. And um, that, I think, is also problematic, because we don't have any ability to either incentivize or shame uh, media outlets uh, into uh, making their coverage, um, d designing their coverage so that it has a greater social impact. So that's what I'm thinking about. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll keep it there. That's very interesting. Lots of points to pick up on there. Um, Laura's presentation has been located. She's ready to go. Do you want to take it away? Yeah, let me, Great. Learn from there. So on that same note, the Life You Can Save thinks a lot about how we can influence the most people through the media. Um, this picture here is um, a, a campaign that we did two years ago where we gave away free money on the street. and. We did it basically as quick bait to get uh, <laughs> the news organizations to cover it, and we were covered by Fox 5 in the DC region. Um, basically, we were giving away free money and then asking people, would you like to keep the money or would you like to give it to an effective organization? And we would tell them about the options. And the vast majority of people gave it um, back to us to donate to the Against Malaria Foundation. Um, we also, on our website, um, try to use different tools to to get people to understand the basic ideas behind effective altruism or effective giving. So here's our charity calculator. Um, you can pick one of 16 charities. Um, for those who don't know, The Life You Can Save was founded by Peter Singer. So Peter Singer is a big force in, in deciding which charities we um, choose. 
Um, and so these are our idea of the most effective charities that, that you could be donating to. So you can choose a charity, um, enter an amount of money. I think the slides are going in. Okay, well, anyway, you enter in an amount of money. So here's $100 for these organizations. So here's AMF, if you were to spend $100 with AMF, the results, okay, there's the slide that <laughs> should have been first. So um, you can choose an organization, enter in an amount of money, and see what happens with, what will the result be um, according to the organization and according to um, researchers like GiveWell and other organizations that have studied the impact of these, uh, these donations. And so we try to stay as, as recent as we can be with these organizations and to get the most up-to-date information about where your money is going. So here's Evidence Action, Fistula, SEVA, Population Services. Um, we have SCI on there as well, as well and uh, 16 other organizations. We've recently added the new GiveWell recommendations. So here's Development Media International. Um, and so that's an easy way to kind of communicate in a very simple manner the, the very basic idea of effective giving. Um, and so this is a tool for people who have not yet even heard of effective altruism, haven't yet heard of GiveWell. Um, and it's a, because we know that so many people spend less than one minute or less than five minutes on a website, this is a quick way to get the basic ideas um, across. And of course, oops, a lot, some of these slides seem to be... <laughs> Not in the order I thought they were in. <laughs> um, well, anyway, we have a big disclaimer, and of course, there's a, there's so much more information that you need to go into once you get these these basic simple numbers. Um, but this is to get people's attention, and then we have the information below where they can learn more about these concepts. Um, speaking of development, media international. We focus a lot on media and the impact of media. So video um, and radio, and the ways that we can use them to impact big audiences. And we have to be honest about the audiences in America and around the world, looking at exactly what they actually consume. So those in this room probably do a lot more reading and a lot more looking at charts than the average American. Um, and if you look at media stats, you'll see that unfortunate, well, fortunately or unfortunately, television is still a really big portion of where Americans spend their time. Um, this is uh, changing. Absolutely, especially among millennials. But if you look at the uh, numbers of hours spent, um, by, even by millennials, you'll see that watching television gets a whole lot of um, viewership, much more than uh, video on the internet. Um, and so take these data with a grain of salt. Um, but th all of this is changing. But um, this is one reason why we are going in. We're, we're looking at making documentaries and video. Um, and eventually getting coverage, more coverage on television so that we can reach as many people that we can possibly reach. Because if you look at the numbers of people giving in America and the world today, um, it really dwarfs the number of people or the amount given in the EA movement. Um, so that brings us to our video, which I hope will play. So, so basically we're focusing on um, reaching the majority of people, and especially the majority of people who are giving philanthropically in the US and throughout the world. And so we're really going through many channels, not just online, because we recognize that um, not everyone's going to spend a lot of time on a website. And so more than going to news footage on the television, we're looking to make documentaries that will then be picked up and seen by millions of people rather than thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that's our long-term goal. And right now we're in pre-production on a documentary featuring Peter Singer. So if anyone is interested in talking further about that, we can chat afterwards. <laughs> and I guess maybe... Oh. Uh, sorry. Yay! Yay. Okay. Yeah. This is what I take. I'm Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna be changed. I'm gonna show you the keys. Oh, man, what? Is the only guy in it? Yeah, it's the only one. So, guys, wow. This is our tool for you. I'm gonna have to go. 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 I'm
Franz. <laughs> Tabo. Oh, keren. making a documentary on this guy, so we can talk about it later. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, Dylan, why don't you talk to us a bit about your work and how it relates to effective altruism? Uh, sure. Well, I got involved with sort of the ideas around effective altruism before I got involved with journalism, that as a teenager I read Peter Singer mostly to troll a Catholic friend of mine. Um, but, but I wound up being persuaded by a lot of it. And uh, uh, then as a college student, I, I started working as a researcher at the Washington Post and started having money. And I had read Famine, Affluence, and Morality and realized I should give some of the money away, which led me to give well, which led me to sort of the VA community at large. Um, as it relates to my work, I think um, A, it's just like a very interesting topic uh, that uh, to be interested in the topics that effective altruism is interested in is to like be a human who is alive in the world. Like everyone is interested in what your career should be. Everyone is interested in like how to do good in your life, where you should get money, what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. Um, and so I find it fascinating to cover just as a journalist, apart from any interest in the movement. Um, but also, I think I, I write in a, a political context like like Nico, and uh, I think when thing about effective altruism is that it gets people to think in a more cosmopolitan mindset and a more rigorous mindset about how government can uh, can improve people's lives and can improve lives of, of non-humans. Uh, and so it provides an interesting perspective that you don't often see in, in media, which is a which is always something you're trying to do as a journalist. You're always trying to find uh, an angle that, that someone else isn't pursuing. So. Um, I, it's, it's helpful for me in that perspective, and I also identify as an effective altruist and think it's an important movement and uh, think these are ideas worth spreading. Okay, very, very interesting. Some points of overlap, some points of difference between you all. Uh, let's pick up on some of those points. Actually, Dylan, let's start with you. That sure. point about uh, this subject matter is fascinating to you personally, and you want to write about it. Mm -hmm. um, is that enough for your editors? <laughs> that you want to write about it. Are, I mean, they, are enough people going to want to click on that article? Uh, I had a meeting a couple of days ago with Ezra Klein, my editor, who where he demanded more effective altruism coverage. So <laughs> we're having <laughs> we're having good results with that so far. I mean, I, I think it, it really is, and I think there are, there are a number of reasons for that. One is just the change that has happened. I think we, like most news organizations, get most of our traffic from Facebook. I think it's something like 60 to 70 percent of our, our incoming clicks come from Facebook. And uh, to succeed on Facebook, you need things that people want to share, and the things that people want to share are things that say something about them as a person. And uh, EA, for better or worse, like, is a good source of that, that people like, like to share things about doing good, about helping others. Um, and I think it helps reverse some of the negativity bias that's sometimes prevalent in, in, in the media, that there's an incentive to tell sort of positive stories in a way. Uh, one of the more successful pieces I've, I've written in terms of just like raw traffic is a compendium of, of sort of positive charts showing positive trends in global development. Um, you know, sort of life expectancy increasing, uh, GDP growth in, in developing countries. Uh, and I think there was a time where that's not a story that would interest your editors because, you know, stuff is m slowly getting very better in various countries is not like a news story. <laughs> uh, it's just sort of an ongoing trend. Um, whereas now people like to, to share sort of encouraging stuff like that with each other. Um, and I think an another thing is uh, it's, it's very easy to tie these ideas in with, with sort of stories that people are discussing. Uh, that are not necessarily EA topics. Um, I thought Will, uh, Will had an article in Quartz uh, last year about the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, that was a perfect example of this, um, that, that you can get millions of people to read about effective altruism when they're already talking with their friends about ALS research and, and dumping water on their heads. 
Uh, similarly, I, I um, got a fair number of readers this week for an article about Cecil the lion and comparing the, the impact of killing a lion in the wild to eating chicken the way that a typical American eats chicken in, in a given year. And I mean, you anger some people doing that, but you, you also like force them to hopefully uh, try to uh, pivot from these, these viral topics into uh, thinking of things in an EA framework. Does it work? Hopefully. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's hard to know. Like, um, and, and I think it's, it's one of these things where you learn very quickly that most people are not going to be persuaded. Most people are fairly set in their views. And so from my perspective, the important thing is trying to reach as many people as possible, knowing that some small percentage of them might, might be persuaded. But if you're, it's a small percentage of a bigger base, uh, then you, you might have more of a shot. Uh, and Nico, the, the, the way that online journalism works now, it lends itself to more data, more data visualization, and using the kind of graphs and charts that people all here love. And that, that article that you wrote, Dylan, about the things that have got better, mm -hmm. full of you know, great charts. And so that helps tell the story a bit, would you say? Adds yeah. The, adds to the ability to tell effective altruism stories to mainstream media. Yeah, to the extent that um, EA stories are often more likely to uh, be centered around data, um, telling those stories has now become, in a compelling way, has become easier. I, I, I wanted to touch on, sort of to go back to my um, hobby horse, uh, uh, convincing journalists to consider this framework. I think more and more reporters are aware of the um, dangers of focusing too heavily on negative news stories when they don't represent the proportion of incidents in the world. I mean, I, I think like, for instance, um, the focus on uh, drug use in the African American community leading to, or at least helping uh, shift along some of the policies that, um, it, drug war policies, criminal justice policies that are now seen as really bad, and and and, um, and I think that that same and that's been a really positive change. It also happens to improve traffic uh, in in the way that traffic dynamics work, but I think it also suggests that they are open to and willing to consider another sort of perspective change on what good journalism is, and and I think it can be, they can be thinking about how to impact the greatest number um, and, and try to achieve the greatest good with their reporting. But this is at the margins though, isn't it? I mean, the vast majority of news output is still the bad stuff. Uh, yes, I guess I, I don't, I mean, um, anecdotally, it seems that way. I wonder with the sort of the news outlets that are ascendant right now, mm -hmm. whether the proportion is the same as um, more established media. My hope is that, or you know, I don't know. I'm curious what others think, but I, I would say that there is part, partly because of the traffic incentives, that the ratio is shifting um, to to be a little more. You know, at Huffington Post we have this initiative called "What's Working." We're trying to um, highlight instant, sort of create copycat solutions, highlight initiatives that are effective, maybe at the local level and raise their prominence, and then cover uh, attempts to replicate them elsewhere. And you know, um, there is both a, we're doing that for both of the reasons, because it, it builds our audience and because we think it's an important part of journalism that has been ignored. Interesting. Now, uh, Dylan was just saying that Ezra demanded more <laughs> PA coverage. Did, what about Ariana? <laughs> Um, she uh, gently asked, uh, yes, requested that there be more, but didn't demand it. So I, I need to go back to her and imagine she can get. Make sure she can demand it if she wants. It's <laughs> <laughs> a polite request. Uh, and Laura, you were talking about how you know uh, your organization, the Life You Can Save, is thinking about which me which type of media will be best to get your message out there. And it's interesting that you sort of uh, talked about kind of you talked about getting coverage on Fox Five for that video that you did. Yeah. I'm interested to kind of understand uh, what sort of coverage that was. So basically, that was at the very beginning um, of our kind of 
expansion, and, and I don't mean to, to pit different forms of media against each other, but more say that it's important to expand into all forms. Um, and so if you're only doing online, if you expand to television or if you expand to newspapers, you are going to get a few more people aware of, of your organization. Um, with Fox 5, it was, I mean, we, were, we weren't specifically targeting Fox 5, but they Not were sure. the ones who they cover the story. Yeah. The story. Do they um, cover the story to your satisfaction? Do they cover the right story? <laughs> Um, we didn't give them too many options. I mean, you know, it was, it was it was a very simple thing that we were doing, and the reason that we we made it so simple is so that it wouldn't be such a vast, complex thing that they could focus in on something that wasn't the actual point. So um, it was a very simple question that we were asking everyone who walks by: Would you like to keep this twenty, or would you like to give it to the Against Malaria Foundation? And if they wanted to know more, we would tell them more. Um, so so really, they covered exactly what we were doing, um, and we kept it simple because we know how mainstream media works. And do you think it got the point? I'm assuming that was a short video, say yeah. two minutes or something maximum. It was, it, I'd say three or four, but okay. I mean very, well, you know. You've got a feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, I, I was pleased with the coverage. They actually okay. did give it a, a little bit of time. And you felt that they told the right story. Yeah, not, you know, I wouldn't have written it exactly in the words that they did, but for their audience, and, you know, I'm sure they're best at targeting uh, their media to their audience, and, you know, I, I think they told the story that, that we were trying to get out there, yeah. Okay, that's good, because my next question to all of you is, do you think a traditional medium like television, which you just showed us, is still a dominant form of medium, media that's being consumed, is it the right vehicle, the right way to tell stories that require a lot of nuance? Mm -hmm. You've talked about moving to documentary, which is a longer form, which allows you to tell that and allows you to make it right. yourself, to control what you're creating. Right. But news coverage, for example, of effective altruism, can it do it justice? Do you guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of experience in, in TV news. Um, I mean, I think it's visuals are a tricky medium, but we, um, we found that people are receptive to, to online videos that, that try to explain sort of abstract concepts. Uh, you obviously lose some detail, um, but in part because uh, you can use charts and other data visualizations um, as a way to get people visually interested while also conveying sort of a, an awful lot of information very, very efficiently. Um, uh, I think, think people have gotten better at that, but I, I can't really speak to TV news. Mm -hmm. Uh, you guys have HuffPost Live, which I think is a bit closer. Yeah, I, although I, I'm not involved. I, I, I don't know. It's, um, it's probably, I don't know. My guess is the case that uh, video as a medium is really well suited to expanding the circle of empathy, that, um, which is a, another sort of core ethic of journalism, uh, in my view, um, and maybe you know, less good than some other mediums at presenting nuance, but uh, it's definitely done well. I mean, the, like Dylan says, the, some of the Vox Explainer stuff is very nuanced and very intelligent and also really successful. And, and Nora. <laughs> panelists to project their voices oh, the yes, sorry. Speak up, <laughs> speak up. Um, Laura, you, you showed us some slides, one of which was um, research from Pew about media consumption. I mean, you went through them very quickly, but I'd seen it before, which is why I recognized it. Um, talking about the kind of media trends that are up and what people are consuming less of. Uh, now, interestingly in that, podcasts are going through the roof. Right, actually. absolutely. Um, I think that's probably quite a, a good way for you to get your message across because it's slightly longer form, it's more discursive, it allows you to actually have a conversation with someone. Totally, and we, we just started our The Life You Can Save podcast, so it's going to be coming out. Um, we're recording them all now, and it'll be coming out next month. But I completely agree with you. Um, personally, everywhere that I go, I'm always listening with my headphones to various podcasts. It's a great way to get information and not have to be sitting in front of your laptop to consume it. Um, and, and to just go back to your point about television, I completely agree with you. There's so much oversimplification, especially in the news and also um, in reality television, which is another way to bring people into this movement through the ideas um, and, and reach a, a much wider audience than might be reading a particular book. For me in particular, or just my personal experience, um, I first got into EA through reading Peter Singer's writings during college, but not everybody will be reading Peter Singer's writings during in college, and so um, our idea is basically to to get at least the basics concepts out there, so that people who have the 
these thoughts already percolating in their minds and think that they're the only one in the world who, who care about these things um, can say, interesting, let me look that up. And then online, they'll find the plethora of stuff we have out there. Mm, interesting. Just on the point of podcast, the CGD podcast is a must listen <laughs> yeah. once a week. Must just point that out to all of you over here as well. Um, let's move on to a slightly more controversial question. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, Nico, you talked about this. Um, how many journalists think about what stories, what, whether their stories will have great, the greatest social impact when they set out to write them? Um, and you just talked about um, social impact being within your code of ethics as a journalism. But is it the job of the journalist to change the world or to report the world? Well, I think um, uh, many of the, I think, uncontroversial attendants of, of journalism are uh, highlighting injustice, um, exposing falsehoods, or, or uh, improving accuracy of information. And I think within those uh, realms, you can have more or less impact, and, and that decision I, I would say uh, the question of what story will produce the most impact is not one that journalists think about uh, enough. So I, I, um, whether or not they are trying to change the world, whatever impact they're trying to have by exposing an injustice or um, highlighting a falsehood or some you know one of these areas, I think they can also think about the extent to which that falsehood will impact others. Uh, yes, so I guess I'm not accepting your, the, the, <laughs> the, um, the premise that journalists don't uh, already want, uh, aren't already attempting to change the world. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I have to say, when I went into journalism many, many years ago, um, I did it because I wanted to make a difference in the world. I wanted to change the world. You're nodding vociferously. Presumably, that's why you did it as well. <laughs> no, no, it's just, just acknowledging that's why a lot of people do it. Yeah. Um, but what I found, and I'm giving you a little bit of a spoiler for my talk this afternoon here, so make sure you come to that as well. Um, this is like plug center, <laughs> <laughs> free advertising space. Um, I found when I covered Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013 for the BBC, um, Journalistically, it was a great endeavor. Enjoy, enjoyed it in that journalistic sense of enjoying a story. Did good work. But I noticed that my job as a journalist is to talk about what other people are doing. And what I wanted to do was be doing the doing. And so for me, and I don't, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, at that point, given the organization I worked for, the BBC, I realized that my job as a BBC journalist is to tell the story of the world as it is, good or bad, warts and all. It is not for me to step over that line to be doing the doing. That's when I realized that I needed to make the move. And I knew moved into the nonprofit world. Um, that's the point that I was getting at, I think. It's the job of the journalist, or should it be the job of the journalist, to just tell the story of the world as it is and hope that someone watching or reading or listening will take the initiative to make the change. I. If I can jump in. I, I think you find um, in all forms of media that even the slightest tweak can change the response so much. Um, I think there was a podcast about a, a change on a Facebook uh, notice where they changed the word it's. You know, they changed the most minor word and it increased the feedback that they got for, you know, whatever their desired response was by like 36%, just this one three letter word. Um, and I think within media, I think there is an infinite feedback loop dealing with what you're saying between what you report and what people hear and what people do. But I think the small tweaks that we can make and the perspectives that we cover, there are obviously an infinite number of things happening at any moment and an infinite number of perspectives relaying or reflecting upon that. What we choose to focus on and how we choose to focus on it can have a huge impact on the way people react to that coverage. Mm -hmm. Guys, would you like to pick up on those, some of those points? Um, yeah, I mean, Vox is a fairly different organization from the BBC. We were founded by people with backgrounds in opinion journalism, and so I think we've, we've always been fairly comfortable with people um, uh, voicing, voicing opinions. Um, I mean, I think EA is, is a fairly uh, unique community to cover in this way, and I, like, I think 
if I were covering another sort of community or another set, I would be much more hesitant to sort of dive headfirst into it. Um, but the main risk of that is that you lose an ability to be self-critical and to be critical of what you're covering and you identify too closely with, with the subject. And uh, one great thing about effective altruism is that there's a strong culture of self-criticism and of, of aggressive like questioning of, of premises and, and of, uh, I mean, we opened this conference with calls for people to be um, trying to think of ways to disprove their views about what the most important cause is. Um, and I think that that's both sort of a, a defense against the danger there and very consonant with the values of journalism as I see them, that, that it's, it's, uh, there's a similar commitment to um, trying to not fall into tribalism or, or um, take sides or become part of a team, but to, to try to look as objectively as, as a human with human biases and whatever can, um, and then reach the conclusions that you're going to reach. Uh, a few thoughts. One is, you, when you were writing for the BBC, um, you know, your article constraint was, say, 800 words. So you, you already are making a range of value judgments about what is important enough to include in the 800 words and what gets left out. And that, that's why I think that, you know, there's no objective journalism. You're all, you're all, there's always some really big value judgments, and you've got to um, accept those. And, and I think the question goes to then to journalists who say we're reporting very accurately the world in whatever stories they were doing when there was a you know genocide in Sudan. They were reporting the world. They weren't reporting on Sudan. Um, what, sh what is the argument, what argument should be made to convince them that they should have instead reported on that or the reporters who uh, highlighted the uh, rash of uh, um, child abductions in the 80s that was wildly overblown and produced a generation of helicopter parents who wouldn't let their kids outside. Um, you know, they were reporting a reality, but, um, and, and I guess beyond that, I, I'm interested in, there is a, uh, there's still a divide between journalism and sort of direct activism. You very rarely see a story, a well-reported story on animal on, on farm animal welfare that ends with a button to donate to uh, Mercy for Animals. And is that reasonable? I mean, why, why is it that way? If the reporter is writing to expose injustice in this realm um, and the individual reading it is at the point where they are going to be thinking about this topic more than they will maybe ever in their life, shouldn't there be an opportunity for them to take action? And what is the responsible way to do that without uh, devaluing or you know, harming the legitimacy of the reporting? Or I think it's a really important question. I think, I would, I think uh, if we could answer it and provide a way for outlets to um, include those opportunities to give, it'd be a great thing. Have you or anybody here come across riot.org? Do you know them? R-Y-O-T.org. So riot.org is a, a news website based in Venice Beach, California, um, that does exactly that. So they report the news. It's aimed at millennials. Report the news. At the end of the story, there is an action that you can take. And they do that because they say millennials are turned off by the news unless they feel they can get involved. And then they're really interested in world affairs. Mm. Uh, and then that allows them to kind of take an action as well. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting outfit. We're going to come to comments and questions in just a second. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of mention that on that point. You talked a little earlier to me about wanting journalists more to incorporate effective altruism principles in their work. Just explain to us a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, I guess we, even with it, within any given beat, I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing for like industry publications that are reporting what happened in a congressional hearing or there's there are various reporters who for whom this won't apply but there are many for whom in their beat they can decide amongst a range of stories and you know as I said um, I don't know what I don't know what the standard should be for them 
I'd love to figure it out. And I'm, re I'm actually really eager to work on this and, and maybe create a product that helps reporters do this. And if anyone is interested, please um, email my first name at HuffingtonPost.com. I'd love to work on this this year. Um, but, you know, so say uh, if, there, if we made a, a resource that showed uh, a list of um, causes of pre pre preventable death, the, the conflicts with the greatest number of casualties in the past year. Um, a lot of them people will know, but a lot of them in both, in both rankings, and there are plenty of other rankings I think we could come up with. Um, I think there'd be reporters who would A, be surprised, oh wow, I didn't know, uh, you know there were 2,000 deaths in Mexico last year, and they're number six in the casualty rankings. Um, I should, that A is interesting for a story, and B, it means that I can have an impact, you know, it, it, I can report on something that's impactful. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, but I don't know exactly what that would look like, uh, particularly for all the range of beats that exist. I'm going to open up to questions in just a minute. Uh, Keith, just a minute. <laughs> um, but briefly, what I'd like to do is, because we have, a, you know, three exceptional communicators here, I'm going to put you on the spot and say in three sentences, because I'm a firm believer that there's no story that can't be told in three sentences. Um, explain effective altruism as you see it in three sentences. <laughs> and I may get some of you to do the same as well. Actually, we have, uh, is, is Will McCaskill there here? Is he still there? He was here. Maybe snuck out. And this is coming to both of you guys as well, Nico and Dylan as well. So I'm just staring into space thinking <laughs> for it. Okay. Does it have to be exactly three? No, thereabouts. Okay. Not like the, the two sentences that the guy in the last panel was asked to come up with <laughs> five minutes later. Um, I mean, I would basically just say effective altruism is a movement of people who are working to find, who care about what is the most important Start over. <laughs> Effective altruism is a movement of people who are interested in affecting change in a positive way in the world and figuring out what is the most effective way of doing that. Guys? I thought this something very similar to that people who are who are interested in, in making a positive impact on the world and are committed to using rigorous analysis and social science uh, as tools in that process. Yeah, I would say, how do you use evidence to make the greatest uh, good with your life? You did it in one sentence. Even better. <laughs> okay, that's great. Comments from you guys, brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm going to open it up to some questions.